about uh, um, a little bit of Kubernetes system calls security in particular runtime security and in a general way a little bit of uh, uh, my journey since uh, I've been part of this uh, for quite a bit. First of all, my name is Loris De Giovanni. I am a CTO and founder of a company called Sysdig. We make uh, uh, security and visibility uh, products uh, specifically targeted at uh, modern microservice Kubernetes-based infrastructures and uh, 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 with specific focus on being able to serve enterprise uh, at, uh, at scale. Uh, at the same time, um, starting Sysdig uh, around five years ago is sort of uh, just the continuation of uh, a story that is uh, actually pretty long and starts uh, over uh, 20 years ago. Um, I started doing open source when uh, I was still in school in Italy. Probably some of you might have noticed that uh, my accent is not really from California, even if now I live uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I grew up in Northern Italy. And uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, working on finishing my degree uh, at uh, my university, Politecnico di Torino, my final project was uh, uh, building a network analyzer for uh, our computer networks uh, lab. Uh, at that point, uh, our uh, computer uh, networks professor, uh, Silvano Guy, who came uh, uh, to California uh, as well a couple of years later, uh, firmly believed and they shared the belief that the best way to understand and to learn computer networks is uh, observing them and uh, just look at the packets that are flowing through the networks. Um, that Doing that uh, during those years was not completely trivial, especially uh, in uh, a setup like what we had in our labs, which was uh, essentially mostly Windows machines. Uh, on Windows at that point, there was no way uh, to uh, collect network packets that would not uh, uh, involve spending tens of thousands of dollars or more on a commercial network analyzer that typically was coming with hardware. So we embarked into building one for free. And uh, that WinPickup, the packet capture library for Windows was uh, essentially the first real software that I've uh, uh, written for, for a true audience in my life. We were at around 1999, 2000. And uh, uh, around the same time, a guy called Gerald Combs, uh, living in Kansas City here in the United States, uh, was uh, working on a Solaris network analyzer called uh, Ethereal. Um, when he saw that uh, I had built uh, a packet capture library for, uh, for, for Windows, he ported Ethereal to Windows. And that caused uh, the explosion of both uh, WinPickup and Ethereal. Uh, we often call this, uh, uh, Gerald and I, the weekend project that gets way out, out of hand. Uh, I published these uh, on the university, uh, on, on our research group website, on university research group website. And uh, by the time I got my degree, we were generating more traffic than the rest of the university combined. <laughs> so uh, at the point, uh, I started realizing this could be useful to people. So I, I kept working on this while doing my PhD. Uh, and uh, finally, in 2005, uh, together with Gerald, uh, I started a company uh, around this called Case Technologies. Uh, the problem was that uh, we didn't own the uh, website and the trademark behind uh, Ethereal. And uh, uh, we didn't have the resources to acquire them from uh, Gerald's uh, employer at that point. So uh, since we really wanted to start this company, we decided to fork uh, the Ethereal project and uh, find a new name and find a new home for it and uh, branch it and call it Warshark. So this was uh, the spring of 2006, and that's when uh, uh, Ethereal was renamed and Warshark uh, was, was born. And we started the company around that, and we spent uh, five years, essentially, just making Warshark uh, a very popular network analyzer, and at the same time, growing a company uh, around it. Um, during uh, the time, um, 
I realized uh, how rich of a data source network packets are. Uh, at the same time, uh, after around five years, we uh, the company got acquired uh, by Riverbed, a bigger company based here in San Francisco, and they became the CTO of one of the, uh, one of the business units. Um, while I was there, uh, the product line uh, grew very well, and we expanded actually the product line uh, into a business unit that was uh, selling visibility uh, tools based on, on packets and network data, like NetFlow and that kind of stuff. And uh, the business was uh, uh, growing very nicely. But at the same time, um, I was starting uh, realizing the world was changing. What we were doing was uh, based on essentially using packets to observe uh, what's happening uh, not only on the network, but also uh, inside applications because uh, packets can be dissected. You can understand essentially the protocols in the transactions. And based on that, you can understand what your software is doing on the network, uh, especially when it's using well-known protocols like uh, HTTP or, or, or uh, uh, gRPC or stuff like that. If you think about packets, uh, they have some very nice properties. They're very rich in information. The, you can really uh, find out a lot by, by looking at packets. Uh, they can see everything. I used to say uh, packets never lie. If uh, anything goes through the network and you can listen on, for example, the spam port of the router, you can understand what's happening. Packets can be collected by uh, with minimal overhead and uh, without requiring intrusive instrumentation, right? You can. Uh, just uh, tell your router to mirror the packets on a spam port and uh, and immediately you know you get a lot of visibility without having to install anything on the uh, endpoints uh, on the machines for the reasons packets are uh, the base for many important classes of tools right these are these ones in these slides are just examples uh, of things that you can do by uh, leveraging packets and uh, one thing that always uh, uh, was interesting to me at that point was that uh, typically all of the things that uh, we see in this slide generated major billion dollar verticals and uh, tools that uh, uh, companies were buying and deploying, you know, independently separate tools, even if the underlying data set was uh, pretty much the same data, you know, uh, it, it was packets. So um, it was, very interesting uh, to realize all of these while it was at Riverbed, but also to realize that uh, packets uh, for many of the things that we're doing were going to be dead. What do I mean by this? I mean that uh, uh, our collection uh, vantage point, uh, the spam port of the router or the network tap, you know, tapping into, into a network cable was going, going to disappear. Where is your spam port when uh, you are uh, renting instances from uh, Amazon in AWS? Um, you have essentially virtual machines that are floating inside the Amazon network. You don't really have uh, access to them. Uh, where uh, is your spam port? Or what's the use of your spam port when uh, maybe you're running Kubernetes heavily orchestrated uh, with uh, uh, a bunch of uh, layers of network virtualization, uh, full encryption, and high density. Since the, nowadays, you know, I routinely talk to customers that uh, uh, deploy Kubernetes on uh, big machines, you know, maybe 48, 64 core machines, and they pack hundreds of containers uh, into these machines, which is uh, wonderful from the density point of view, but uh, uh, at that point, if you're listening on a, spam, on a spam port of the router, you're not really seeing a lot of what's happening, you know, inside these machines with so many containers. So just visibility using packets clearly was going to not be effective uh, anymore. And uh, um, uh, clearly uh, the solutions uh, that the industry was uh, finding for this problem were like, uh, you know, uh, refactor existing tools. And that's never an ideal solution when something so new and so radical, radical like containers and Kubernetes uh, come uh, to the world. 
So um, essentially, um, around you know 2013, 2014, I was starting wondering, you know, asking myself myself this question in a multi-cloud world with opaque containers and non-network boundaries. How how can we recreate the uh, all of the nice features of network packets that I just described, right? And uh, I started experimenting, and I've always been, uh, since essentially school, a kernel geek, and uh, really uh, with a love of, for operating systems. So uh, I uh, started uh, uh, working on potential solutions that would be ba would leverage essentially the functionality in the uh, operating system in particular in particular in in linux so how do you deploy uh, the instrumentation uh, that i built for for sysdig and for falco um, uh, in uh, in a modern environment so this slide shows a machine with an operating system with uh, three containers uh, running uh, on the machine, you deploy uh, the Sysdig instrumentation by running uh, another container on the machine. Typically, if you're using Kubernetes, you leverage uh, something like uh, a daemon set to tell Kubernetes, I want one uh, Sysdig container, only one on all of my machines. Uh, if it goes down, bring it up again. Boom, uh, click on enter, and uh, and you have you know the sysdig agent everywhere on your cluster at the point when this con this container starts uh, it uh, uh, deploys some kind of instrumentation in the kernel of the operating system traditionally uh, initially this instrumentation was uh, a kernel module nowadays we leverage uh, ebpf ebpf allows uh, you to uh, script the kernel of the operating system in uh, uh, many flexible ways. Essentially, it's a virtual machine that runs in the kernel that is uh, very high performance, but it's also verified. So when you inject code in the kernel, uh, this code is verified both uh, from uh, the security point of view and from the stability point of view. So uh, you're guaranteed that no matter what you do, uh, unless there are bugs in the kernel of the operating system, you, you won't uh, create a risk or a performance uh, issue for the, for the operating system. One interesting thing about uh, eBPF is it, it, the acronym stands for uh, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Uh, the Berkeley Packet, Packet Filter is uh, part of the filtering facilities uh, in the operating system that were initially designed to filter network packets and on which I was working during the late 90s uh, for, for packets. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, uh, this functionality has evolved quite a bit inside the Linux kernel and now it's so flexible that it can be used for much more stuff. In particular, uh, uh, SSD, we use this to collect uh, uh, many kernel signals, but one important one that we collect is system calls. System, system calls mean every time you open or close a file, that generates a system call. Every time uh, you read or write data on the file system, that's a system call. Uh, establishing or receiving connections uh, on the network, system calls. Transferring data on the network, all system calls. Uh, user level activity, inter-process communication, uh, uh, talking to the external world. These, these are all system calls. So it's sort of like a, a data source that is even richer. It's a superset of packets and can be collected in a way that does not require any modification in the uh, target containers because you are sort of living underneath the containers and you're able to see all of this activity very, very rich without uh, the user requiring to link a library, install a daemon, or do anything that uh, would break, you know, an elegant CI-CD uh, uh, process to create and use these containers. At the same time, it's very efficient because it uses some really, really uh, optimized facilities in the, in the operating system and uh, is designed with the same philosophy that we were using to collect packets on 10 or 40 or 100 gigab gigabits networks without a performance impact. So we're creating something that is conceptually similar to the spam port 
of a router, but instead of collecting packets, collects much richer data in a way that is uh, not invasive and has uh, all of the nice features uh, of, of the packets and works very, very beautifully with containers and Kubernetes. Absolutely. Cool. Also, uh, just on that I am on a uh, different Lawrence. window I think, uh, uh, of, it, it, uh, of I might my just browser, quickly run so a poll I cannot around see just, very you know, see, see a but, uh, from you know, how many people uh, are running Kubernetes in production, yeah, if that's other okay. Other speakers, please uh, because it's feel a, free to, you know, if it's, these questions it, are asked, it will give us a good insight as to, you know, how people uh, and, uh, and there's are the question um, in the, in the doing things. So, folks might see a quick poll on their screens. We Please answer the poll if you can. We will just wait for half of the folks to answer and then we'll move forward. Um, in the meantime, Loris can catch a breath as well. <laughs> yeah. No, all good. Um, so what I'll do is we'll we'll, uh, we'll looking at the chat anyway. And uh, what I've done is I've, uh, I've started kind of two polls. One is uh, are people using Kubernetes in production, and the other one is uh, what flavor Kubernetes people are running today. Uh, if I if we can get folks to answer those two quickly, and then we'll then carry forward um, many, with our talk because providers. I think that's a very rich insight into what Loris is talking about. Um, and given mostly people are leveraging uh, absolute Kubernetes these days. All right. So um, um, I talked about how to, how to solve the problem of collecting data in a about. containerized uh, environment. Now, we are all using Kubernetes uh, oh. nowadays, and uh, collecting data is only part all of right. the uh, equation. Sounds the like other important thing that you need to be GKE, uh, able to EKS. do is uh, make sense There's of this data, and in particular, uh, aggregate this data cool. in a way that is uh, service oriented. Many so this slide yeah. shows I like just, you know, on the left side of the slide, and okay. each host, cool. for the sake of, a, of the, an yeah. example, is running four containers. And the color co color coding here for the for the containers is the service they belong to. Right? You typically, uh, unless you know you're the, you're the cluster uh, uh, owner, you you don't you're not really interested in seeing things like on the left side uh when you're you know uh, securing uh your your applications your services your infrastructure uh you really want to do that on a service by service basis think about that uh the, the security profile and requirements of uh, your production credit card validation service uh which uh it, uh, as sensitive data and needs to be PCI compliant are very different from uh, your internal test, uh, you know, uh, uh, database uh, that uh, only has, uh, you know, uh, uh, random data and uh, is uh, only, you know, used for development and, uh, and you don't care too much about that. So you need to be able to, uh, Especially when you do when you do runtime visibility in your cluster, you need to be able to do that in a way that is uh, uh, service oriented, that uh, is team oriented. Because typically, service services. The reason why we do service uh, microservices uh, and service oriented uh, uh, applications is because we want to have you know distributed ownerships and we want uh, different teams to be able to have access, you know, to, to different parts of the infrastructure. So security absolutely needs to, needs, needs to do the same. And when you uh, receive uh, your, your security alerts, you want to be able to do that uh, in a way that uh, routes them properly to, to, to the different teams that own these services. So let's uh, stop with, with the theory. Uh, and uh, let's look 
uh, a little bit about uh, how these things can be put in practice when we're talking about runtime security for Kubernetes. And I want to talk specifically about Falco. Falco is a project that uh, I started in 2016 uh, with, uh, again, uh, the idea of uh, taking what uh, worked with packets and transposing it to the modern world of containers and microservices. In particular, uh, uh, in, 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 in the world of packets and in the world of computer networks, uh, network intrusion detection tools like uh, Snort or Suricata or Bro uh, are very popular. They essentially uh, constantly look at network traffic and uh, they are able to apply rules policies to the network traffic, these rules can generate alerts. For example, I don't know, a, a, a PDF file uh, that is actually a Perl script has been, uh, you know, uh, downloaded from China, you know, something like that. So you can create rules that uh, look inside the, inside the periods of the, of, of the packets or look at the network traffic and uh, alert you when some anomaly activity happens. Uh, when I started working on Falco, I was thinking, okay, imagine if you could do something like that, but with a much richer, much more powerful data set of system calls. Um, and we started working essentially on a rule engine can, that could sit on top of the system call uh, capture and the Kubernetes metadata technologies that I just described. Um, Falco uh, uses kernel events as a source of truth and reaches them with uh, by by talking to the Kubernetes API, and then uh, sends you alarms when something goes wrong. Uh, uh, from the community point of view, in uh, October 2018, we donated Falco to CNCF, and recently, a few months ago, Falco has been promoted to incubation. So we are really, you know, uh, uh, pushing something that uh, is community first here, because we strongly believe that uh, innovation. Uh, in the modern world uh, is really driven by, by community uh, and uh, especially something that is uh, rule-based like Falco can really benefit by being tested by many users and by having many contributors around the world. Falco works uh, uh, relatively simply by collecting kernel events, system calls, but also other types of data. So for example, uh, Kubernetes audit events, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and other data sources and uh, run essentially a, uh, an engine, a rule engine uh, on top of this data. Uh, and then uh, the output of Falco is very flexible and can be you know, either consumed in very simple ways, like be printed on the console or can be integrated with anything, you know, SIM tools, uh, web hooks, uh, SDKs, uh, uh, login systems uh, and so on. So there's a tens of integrations that you can uh, uh, use to plug Falco in, into essentially whatever whatever you like uh, to to get these alerts and uh, and uh, uh, process them. Examples of uh, what you can do with Falco. Uh, this is the first one is a rule that uh, detects if a shell is running a container, typically something you don't want in your immutable, immutable infrastructure. And if it happens, it's probably because somebody was able to you know, find an exploit and, and get inside uh, one of your applications. Overwriting system binaries, um, namespace changes. So somebody that is trying to escape a container you know, and go into another container, uh, fooling around with uh, device files, um, act, trying to access, you know, devices like cameras or the kind of stuff. Actually, let's take a second and let's uh, look at this in practice. So what I'm going to do is uh, I am just, you know, going to my Linux uh, lock virtual machine and uh, I have just, you know, started the vanilla Falco container uh, coming from, from the Falco uh, community. And as you can see, uh, the container started, uh, instrumented the operating system, and uh, now uh, it's uh, already detecting something, which is detecting itself starting, you know, uh, and, and Falco, of course, needs to be a privileged container. And now uh, I can, you know, uh, on, on the same machine, I can do something like uh, uh, touch 
slash bin slash cat. So I'm modifying a system binary. And sure enough, <clears throat> Falco is detecting it. And he's telling me, you know, uh, which file uh, uh, that the file uh, under um, slash bin has been modified, which file is it, uh, what was the common line, uh, and uh, a bunch of other information. And of course, this magically sits inside container. So if I start an Ubuntu container, uh, first of all, Falco kindly tells me that a shell was spawned inside, uh, spawned inside the container, which is right. And then I can do the same, uh, touch slash bin slash cat. And now I get uh, a, an alert that tells me uh, information like the container ID, the image, uh, and uh, a bunch of information. If I if I was using Kubernetes, I would have you know all of the service information and the context and all all, all of all of the stuff that I need. So uh, very simple. But this is this is Falco in a nutshell. You know uh, the operation of it is is pretty simple. But what it, it can do is very powerful. And what's important here is uh, being able to detect uh, all of this stuff at runtime. So we know, of course, that uh, like. Uh, Container image scanning is uh, something very important that you need to do uh, with your software and integrate it in, in your pipeline. And it's very important nowadays, and there are ways to essentially ship software that can be you know, very secure by default, but runtime is always runtime. Runtime is the source of truth. You know, It's where uh, the bad stuff happens. So uh, of course, you need uh, 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 to be able to, to to ship software as secure as possible, but it's also important to have something like Falco that looks at, at your software as it runs. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, you're touching on a very good point. Runtime security is absolutely uh, pivotal these days with Kubernetes or not. And on that note, I also have another poll. So I just want to see uh, what folks are using for Kubernetes runtime security today in the environment. Um, so I've just uh, clicked, uh, kicked off uh, another poll. This is mostly, uh, so the one Falco, that we have on the screen is around uh, your Kubernetes either, monitoring and observability. Uh, either it is um, because it goes hand in hand with when you're looking at the runtime security, you need to use, um, how you're actually uh, for, monitoring for your Docker. environment and the other yeah, thing. Uh, required this is from my experience. Because, uh, I, yeah, I talked about this a few days ago as well. When you start with the vanilla you cluster, need to, to have, uh, you, you know, sort of uh, forget uh, some of these important the perspective aspects. There. And for example, you need to be able to, are, to install you know, a kernel model. Um, In a lot, second, there was a question I will on the show as well. you something that we are uh, working does Falcon on uh, that uh, allows you to not require the privilege capabilities. All right, so keeping talking about Falco, Falco is completely community driven. So uh, there's a community that uh, decides essentially uh, what is the roadmap for Falco. There's a bunch of end users that provide input, and there's a bunch of vendors. So oh, really? one of them, um, but not sweet. the only so one I of think them. The that, uh, for essentially, uh, I see package, people are you know, answering Falco the other. It would be good if folks can uh, one if example, folks example uh, what they're using in that, the chat, uh, and then maybe we can. Uh, I, you know, like a lot of uh, using that as well Falco but over as, uh, as scale as an open source tool uh, is uh, Shopify. Shopify uh, uh, has uh, uh, adopted Falco essentially to protect uh, at runtime their PCI environment. They, they run, uh, I don't remember uh, how many uh, websites uh, in, their, in their environment uh, on Kubernetes, uh, on AWS and DKS. Uh, and then uh, they use Falco essentially to uh, uh, enable PCI compliance. And uh, they do this on uh, uh, a set of websites that uh, generates like $150 million per day, you know, in, in, in sales. So this is 
uh, real scale and uh, uh, it's uh, very interesting how they use essentially Falco to check what uh, every single container is doing and then collect this data and create essentially PCI, PCI reports. Uh, Shopify is always uh, is also a user that is uh, engaged with the community and uh, uh, at the next KubeCon in Amsterdam, actually, uh, they will uh, uh, participate to the keynote of KubeCon, and they will talk about uh, essentially them using Falco to do runtime security uh, on stage. Uh, KubeCon uh, Europe, uh, as many of you know, probably this year is going to be online. So even if you're from Australia, you can probably, uh, you know, still join join it. And uh, and the first day um, uh, keynote. We'll we'll talk about uh, Falco and will be will be held by Shopify. Um, Falco is al also of course integrated with uh, anything you can imagine around. So starting from like Prometheus Helm, uh, OPA, uh, of course Kubernetes, uh, to any cloud provider, uh, and uh, also you know many SDKs and ways to plug it into whatever you might you might want. Uh, let me stop for a second to see, uh, just in case there are there are more questions before I keep going. Okay, good question. Let me continue because I'm going exactly into that. Okay, so the, the, I don't know what's the, the question, but uh, perfect. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so uh, the, the what I want to talk about was, is uh, uh, actually, you know, going a little bit in into the, question the bleeding section, edge of what was, we're doing, you know, um, with, uh, as works uh, with, PDF, with system general, call catcher and, and, and with Falco. Uh, one uh, of uh, the things that I've uh, been personally involved with in the recent months is uh, what we call kernel-less uh, system call capture. Yeah, so it's on the if, question tab. Uh, inside we go back to the no, diagram that I'll, I had, I'll uh, in the slide before. <laughs> this is you know uh, the, what I described in terms of capture, right? And this requires to deploy uh, either an, an eBPF script or a kernel module in the kernel. Why did we originally chose this? Uh, as the way to do our instrumentation uh, for two reasons. One is uh, it's efficient, and the other one is it's accurate. Efficiency-wise, uh, in your typical uh, uh, average load application, you should have a hard time measuring the impact, the slowdown on your application uh introduced by capturing system calls for falco uh this is because uh, you know uh, i don't have time to go into the detail into all of the details here but uh, essentially we applied uh, all of the optimizations that uh, were part of uh, my phd my phd was uh, uh, about high speed packet capture and uh, we trip you know, the capture of system calls in a way very similar. So uh, it turns out, you know, many of those optimizations you can apply it here, uh, ranging from a, a, a complete uh, shared memory so that there's, there are no copies of the data to go to the, to go to the capture, to being able to uh, have a capture ring per CPU and disable preemption. So there's a completely lockless way to capture these events, uh, and uh, that requires only a few clock cycles essentially to do the, the, the synchronization. So there's quite a lot going on, you know, in this eBPF program. Uh, so efficiency is very important, of course, and uh, uh, Falco from the from the capture point of view is very efficient. It's also very accurate because when you when you're in the kernel, you remember I said before, packets never lie. Well, we can say the same about the kernel of the operating system. The kernel never lies, unless you really are sophisticated enough to be able to go and modify, you know, the kernel of the operating system, which is pretty hard, hardened, you know? It's, uh, it's uh, pretty hard for an attacker to fool around the instrumentation. The limitation of uh, uh, this mechanism is, we're talking about cloud before, you know, and the fact that 
most of uh, the poll was very interesting. Most of the users use cloud providers, right? And more and more in cloud providers, there are environments where you don't even uh, rent virtual, uh, virtual machines instances anymore, but you just rent containers, you know, just for the time they run. And in that case, you don't have access to the kernel of the operating system because uh, uh, this, is a, this is a multi-tenant, you know, uh, environment where Amazon doesn't give you access to the kernel. So what you can, what can you do in an environment like that? Uh, if we think about uh, which technologies you can use, uh, one that comes to mind is uh, using LD preload. So being able to essentially somehow swap the C library of uh, of uh, of the application the application that is running inside the container and uh, essentially instrument the C library is the mediator between software uh, and uh, the operating system kernel. So you can see system calls uh, as a consequence. Uh, of uh, the fact that uh, C library functions like open or close or socket or connect or accept are done, right? So that works, but there's uh, a bunch of limitations. Uh, the main uh, of uh, the main one is uh, uh, there. Are, this requires applications to use use the C libraries, and there are many classes of applications. For example, Go programs that are fully statically linked and, and they don't use libc. So the problem with uh, uh, using this kind of user level uh, techniques uh, to uh, go and uh, and change essentially the libraries that an application is is loading is uh, again uh, they, they are uh, not accurate because uh, uh, in some in, with some stacks, they just don't work, right? Another potential um, uh, approach to this is using ptrace. Ptrace is uh, the functionality in the Linux operating system that uh, uh, debuggers like GDB use to uh, attach to another program, uh, introspect it, uh, set breakpoints, stop it, start it, uh, and do all of this kind of stuff, right? So there's enough goodness in Ptrace to be able to implement something uh, similar to what I described that we do in the kernel. And with Ptrace, essentially, uh, Ptrace is harder to fool because it, it does use essentially a facility in the operating system and you can run you know, something inside the same container that leverages Ptrace to collect this, this information. So instead of being down in the kernel, you get this information out in, into a program that is running inside the same container. Ptrace is accurate because uh, uh, it doesn't require, you know, it doesn't rely on, on the C library or, or, or other stuff like that. It has two limitations. One is performance. The reason why traditionally uh, Falco is based on, on, on uh, eBPF is because eBPF is much more efficient than Ptrace. And the other one is uh, Ptrace uh, is disabled in Fargate uh, for example, for the same reason why kernel modules are disabled, because uh, it is an advanced functionality that uh, requires uh, uh, access to the kernel of the operating system. Well, it turns out that uh, we were able to uh, do quite a bit of work uh, uh, related to dynamic instrumentation at user level to remove essentially the performance limitations of, of Ptrace and work with Amazon uh, which uh, recently, like uh, no longer than a couple of weeks ago, has announced uh, uh, this, the Ptrace capability in Fargate 1.4. So uh, if you use, uh, you know, uh, EKS uh, or uh, containers on Amazon um, uh, uh, at this point, you will be able to essentially uh, leverage the Ptrace functionality. And we have built essentially a Ptrace connector for Falco that does not require a privileged container, of course, doesn't require to put anything in the kernel of the operating system, and um, uh, is uh, uh, efficient enough, or at least we're working on making it efficient enough that is almost as performant as the kernel instrumentation that I was talking about before. Let me prove it to you. Uh, to make uh, uh, sure that I don't lie. So I am switching to my AWS uh, console and I created um, a couple of uh, tasks here. Uh, one in particular is uh, running essentially a container where uh, I installed uh, uh, Falco together with PDIG, which is our Ptrace 
uh, system call collector. Uh, and uh, notice how I'm running this on the on uh, Fargate 1.4, but there's still a bug <laughs> in the in the uh, AWS console, and it's showing it. Uh, 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 platform 1.3.0, but I promise you it's uh, it's 1.4. So now what I can do is uh, I can uh, go go ahead and uh, log in uh, to that container. And uh, when I'm inside, if I do a PS, I can see that uh, this container is uh, uh, running um, uh, uh, a bash that. Uh, uh, is uh, uh, being you know started by by SSH, but it's also running Falco. It's running a script that is essentially collecting the Falco logs. Falco has been uh, 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 instrumented to essentially just write the uh, output to to the console. And uh, as you can see, we started this container by uh, running the init script through PDIG. So everything inside this container has been instrumented to ptrace. So I can do something like uh, my typical touch slash uh, bin slash cat. And uh, the data now has been piped by Falco to the AWS uh, console. So if I go, let me refresh this, into the logs uh, of uh, uh, my uh, AWS desk, I can see uh, that uh, Let's do the last one hour. I can see that uh, Falco has uh, detected my activity and has reported it to me to AWS. So we, we've connected uh, essentially uh, Falco user level instrumentation with Ptrace, uh, with uh, AWS CloudWatch, and now you know our container is protected. Uh, this is something that we just announced. Uh, so it's still it's still experimental. I just wanted to show you how you know we are keeping you know working on these and making sure we adapt this way of of collecting data to you know to the modern and ultra modern way of running containers and Kubernetes. Let me stop for another second uh, just just to see if there are if there are other questions. Uh, yes, um, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, I was mentioning before that uh, Falco is uh, um, no, uh, an think, incubated think, project uh, in, uh, in CNCF. In the questions. And, uh, uh, one question CNCF I have, Lawrence, probably, is, is generally with tools like this, which can uh, like uh, this kind of data from the Kubernetes belongs to this foundation. Um, Prometheus belongs to this foundation. You have to go to security so, uh, assessments and lots of, the of checks that, uh, and generally security CNCF folks are is, unhappy with this. They offer have you to ever all had to the do projects, that with Falco or um, get any security assessments or profile? Uh, recurrent uh, security assessments of all of the projects. So uh, people can can deploy them, you know, uh, with, 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 with more confidence. And we just went through one of those like a uh, few months ago. Uh, and in fact, you know, it, it unveiled quite a bit of stuff and everything is done in the open. Uh, what they find is uh, reported, you know, with a public document to uh, the owners of the project. And then, you know, mm -hmm. as, as developers of Falco, we, we go and, and, and address them. So there's quite a bit of care uh, into, you know, uh, making sure that there's a constant uh, uh, assessment of the, uh, security uh, implications of, of, of something like Falco. Yeah. No, brilliant. That's very uh, good. Uh, and the only reason I ask is I've had few people ask that question, not in the public chat, but uh, just outside. And on that note, I might just do a very quick poll again. 
just to uh, see a feeling as to what um, you know the mix of people we have. Are All right, I want to spend just another are you architect, uh, five minutes or uh, DevOps and things talking like a little that. bit so if about. If you can get people uh, to just answer that one very quickly, uh, what for we me, do at Sysdig um, on, top of, good, on top of um, that would be good. So uh, essentially, um, us the as to technological what kind of demographics we have and be it will build on top of that. And I want to do that because I want to show. Another couple um, of interesting so things can you can do with uh, Cisdic called that one. Uh, Capture. Should be on your screen. So first of all, Cisdic Secure uh, is uh, uh, the commercial tool that Cisdic uh, offers, oh, uh, and uh, uh, essentially uh, you can see it as uh, a layer of functionality built on top of Falco. So if you have Falco deployed in your infrastructure, of course, this is completely free, free as a free speech and free as free beer. Uh, but uh, uh, with Sysdig, you can leverage essentially the same agents in the same collection, and uh, we offer uh, simplifications or orchestration, scale, centralized collection, curated rules, metadata, and so on. <coughs> uh, uh, stuff like uh, user interface on top of Falco, alerting, compliance, uh, uh, topology, scanning, and, and so on and so forth. And also a way to connect Falco with uh, many, many other things. Um, and this essentially tries to create a workflow that uh, covers, you know, not only runtime, but they all build, run, and respond essentially phases of running uh, containerized Kubernetes-based applications. So uh, let me give you uh, a couple of examples. Actually, let me start by uh, looking at the rules library. And as you can see in Sysdig Secure, there's a centralized place to manage rules and rules are curated and tagged and uh, easy to essentially deploy and push to your fleet of Falco probes that are across your infrastructure. And as you can see, uh, there, there are you know, rules that are uh, for, for compliance, like PCI and NIST and all of that kind of stuff. And these are nicely categorized and uh, you can you know, apply them and enable and disable them very easily, depending on, for example, the kind of compliance that you want in different parts and different services in your infrastructure. Now, policies generate events. And so uh, when uh, uh, I go to essentially the list of events generated by, by the different Falco probes, now they are aggregated in a, in a central place. And I can see, for example, that uh, uh, Falco is, is telling me that uh, a few hours ago, somebody spawned a shell inside the container. So uh, I can click on the event, I get all of the information, the metadata, the context, the user name, all of the kind of stuff. But I can, you know, now I have the red light, you know, I want to go deeper. So the first thing that I want to do is I click on activity audit and through system call collection, here we are able to see essentially in a centralized place what happened inside the pod uh, around the time when uh, this uh, issue happened. And for example, if we focus on the commands, we can see somebody, you know, did an LS and then curled uh, some malware uh, and, and untarred it uh, on the container and then removed essentially the, the bash uh, history. So this is pretty suspicious, right? So the ability to go from uh, an alert uh, into this kind of uh, data that is sent essentially on a, on a centralized place and can be browsed you know, uh, across your infrastructure is another powerful thing that you can do essentially for investigation uh, reasons. Um, uh, in your infrastructure by using system calls because this is all system call uh, derived data. At the same time, at this point, I'm curious, you know, maybe I want to know more, especially, I'm, uh, you know, I want to do an investigation at this point. Uh, rules uh, in, uh, in Sysdig Secure also uh, optionally allow you to take capture. So you can tell essentially uh, the your Falco probes whenever this kind of alert is generated, also take a capture of all of the system calls. A capture looks a lot like a packet capture, but uh, uh, as, uh, as I was saying, much more information. So if I open it, there's a tool, an open source tool called Sysdig Inspect that uh, is uh, somewhat inspired by Wireshark and, and packet uh, inspection tools, but works on system calls. So here I uh, essentially downloaded my capture and I'm analyzing it uh, on, on my machine. And the first thing that I can do is I uh, can click on the different tiles. This uh, is style oriented and shows me essentially an overview 
of this capture. And uh, I can see, I can start by looking at uh, where I received essentially the alert by Falco. And as you can see, this is 71 seconds that are captured. And uh, I have uh, like, uh, you know, the, the alert that uh, happened probably after around 20 seconds. So let's start looking at, uh, you know, file data, network data, and we can see there's correlation, you know, after the event, stuff happened, right? And I can look at the comments and I can see exactly where the, com the comments that I was looking before are performed. So let's drill down inside these comments and I can see, you know, the wget, the tar and so on. Let's uh, double click on, on tar because we, we want to see what happened on, on this gear. So now we are inside tar, you know, we, we drill down inside a specific process. Of course, you know, this process is gone uh, and uh, uh, which is normal in Kubernetes, you know, by the time you detect that something went wrong from the security point of view, you're almost guaranteed that the scheduler uh, removed the container and you don't have you know any data anymore so the capture is very important and from the capture now we're inside the process and we can look at the directories that the process has written how do we do this because every write to any directory is a system call and, and this tool is able to decode them so i can double uh, double click on the directory and they can see the files that have been written in the in the directory this is the malware that was written uh, to the disk so we can actually you know go and uh, there's a functionality called the uh, eco file descriptors which is similar to follow tcp strings in wireshark and i can use that functionality and as you can see i can look at the file data that was written to this so i can reconstruct the the granular activity of uh, io to disk that was done by a process that is not there anymore and is gone you know uh, was gone hour, hours ago um, this is just uh, an, an example that I wanted to show you of uh, uh, the power and the, and the workloads that are empowered by the relatively straightforward technologies that I was describing before, capturing system calls and giving context to the system calls. And you can really go from, uh, you know, like just a red light blinking in, uh, in your SIM tool into this kind of detail whenever you need. And this is essentially impossible to do in any other way in Kubernetes. This is the end of my presentation. <laughs> so uh, for people that are interested in learning more, this slide contains some links uh, that points to both the Falco open source and uh, to, uh, if you want a free trial of, uh, of Sysdic Secure for the forensics uh, functionality, you find me on Twitter at uh, Loris Dejo. Let me shut up finally, and let's see if there are other questions.